Hello and welcome back to MTG Burgeoning. We are your channel for all things magic. In today's video, we are going to update and upgrade our Zaxara the Exemplary EDH deck. Greetings and salutations to the MTGBC, that is the MTG Burgeoning Community. Welcome back to another installment of our Up and Up series. Today we are going to update and upgrade our Zaxara the Exemplary EDH deck. We're going to cycle out some lands and cycle in some better ones, and then we're going to also put some cards into the 99 that are going to help to enhance and optimize the theme of this deck, which is... X spells and plus one plus one counters. All right, so let's start with five lands coming out and five lands going in. All right, we're going to take one basic forest. You are on the way out to be replaced by a Rejuvenating Springs. This is our Simic fan land that's going to come into play untapped as long as we control two or more opponent. I'm sorry, not if we control two or more opponents. We actually will control them as the game goes on, but their presence at the at the EDH table is necessary for this to come into play untapped. This should be better in most instances than carrying a regular for basic forest. All right, next coming out is a basic island going in. Its place is going to be our Demir Pathway, Clearwater Pathway, or murk water pathway. We pick one side before we put it in the play, and then that's the color of mana that will be generated. Admittedly, this Demir pathway is just a placeholder until we can get a copy available of the Demir fan, la fan land morphic pool. All right, next up as the trend continues, basic swamp coming out, and I bet you can guess at home what's going in next, and that's going to be an undergrowth stadium, the third of our possible fan lands going in, this one of the Golgari nature. All right, next coming out is a prismatic vista. This is our fetch land just for basic lands. So with that coming out, we're going to replace it with a fetch land of higher quality, and that's going to be a Verdant Catacombs. This is going to allow us to get a swamp or a forest. So we are limiting ourselves as the Prismatic Vista could get us an island, a swamp, or a forest. However, the Prismatic Vista is only going to produce a basic land where Verdant Catacombs can seek out one of our dual lands. That will help us to fix our mana so that we can cast any spells we need to in this three-color EDH deck. And the last land swap coming out is going to be Opulent Palace. That is out, and to take its place is going to be target number one with any of the fetch lands we drop down onto the battlefield in the early to mid game. And that's going to be a Zagoth Triome. This is going to do everything that Opulent Palace does, except it's fetchable and we can cycle it if needed. So with these five changes to the land base, we are upgrading the quality of our land and we're upgrading the quality of our mana in order to better cast the spells in this three-color deck. All right, with five lands going in and five lands coming out, we're going to have five non-land cards going in and five non-land cards coming out. All right, so coming out is Gelatinous Genesis. This just never seemed to be a we-must-cast-this-spell-immediately card. The double X with the green to produce XXX green ooze creature tokens seems like it would be a very good fit in a deck that's caring about XX spells and plus one plus one counters, even though plus one plus one counters would not go on this card by itself. We're going to replace the Gelatinous Genesis with something that's going to help better synergize with the overall theme of that of this deck. And with that spell coming out, going in its place is going to be Sequence Engine. 
This is an artifact for two and a green. We can pay X. We can tap this and exile target creature card with mana value X from a graveyard. And that's very important for us because many of the creatures in our deck, they're going to have very, very small mana values because they are X creature spells. So this giving us the ability to use creature cards from our opponent's graveyards, not just for the purposes of activating sequence engine, but also as a way in which to, you know, put a stop to any potential graveyard graveyard shenanigans just makes Sequence Engine a better fit for this deck. So once we exile a creature card with mana value X from the graveyard, we're going to create a 0, 0 green and blue fractal creature token and put X plus 1 plus 1 counters on it. The only drawback is, is that this, we can only do this at sorcery speed. However, Gelatinous Genesis is a sorcery in and of itself, so we can still utilize Sequence Engine during our turn as we would with Gelatinous Genesis, and we could produce a far better creature overall than the mana that we would have to pump in to create XXX green ooze creature tokens. And with all of the spells and effects we have that can double the plus one plus one counters put on permanents we control, we can pay a very minimum amount of mana and utilize the sequence engine for a very, very large return when it comes to the power and toughness of the creature it creates. All right, next spell coming out. It's going to be another X spell. This time it's going to be Death Deny. This is an instant for X and two black. And we return X target creature cards from our graveyard to our hand. So we're going to cut back a little bit on our graveyard recursion. And the purposes of that is as follows. There's not going to be one or two specific cards in our graveyard that are really going to matter because the overall strength of this deck is its synergy and optimization with respect to creating plus one plus one counters and having the X spells. So having death denied in our hand and not really having a need to return any creature cards from our graveyard, it just seems like we're painting ourselves into a corner by holding this niche card in our hand when, when let's be honest, we can replace this card with something that better optimizes our plus one plus one and X our plus one plus one counter and X spell strategy. So taking the place of death denied is going to be an, an equipment called Fractal Harness. This is an equipment X and two green to cast the spell. And when Fractal Harness enters the battlefield, we'll create a zero zero green and blue fractal creature token and put X plus one plus one counters on it with the bonus of attaching Fractal Harness to that creature. So similar to Sequence Engine, we're going to be creating more creatures that will get plus one plus one counters and then, allow, and then allow our plus one plus one synergies to make those creatures even bigger threats. And as an added bonus to Fractal Harness, camera, what are you doing? There we go. Whenever equipped creature attacks, we're going to double the number of plus one, plus one counters on it. So this is kind of like a personalized Colonian Hydra ability, whereas not every single creature with plus one, plus one counters are going to get doubled, just the one that's equipped. And with an equipped cost of two, if we slap this bad boy on any one of the many, many creatures that we have evasion, trample, flying, any kind of potential island, any kind of potential land walk, anything that gets in for unblockable or very hard to block damage, Fractal Harness is going to do a lot more for what we want to do in this deck than Death Denied ever could, particularly when it comes to trying to win the game via combat. All right, next card coming out, and this one, it may seem like it's a very powerful card in this build, but after casting this many, many times and almost never getting anything close to the return on the mana, Animist's Awakening is going to come out. This is another sorcery, X and a green. We reveal the top X cards of our library and put all land cards from among them onto the battlefield tapped and the rest on the bottom of our library in a random order. This has the Spell Mastery mechanic, which reads, if there are two or more instant and or sorcery cards in our graveyard, we do get to untap those lands. With a land to spell ratio of around one to three, no, one to three, no, yeah, one to three. So for every one land, there are three spell, no, one to two, I'm sorry, because it's around 30, mid 30s for the lands and then 67 non-land cards. So one out of three cards is going to be a land and that's just taking it on the average. And of course, anyone who's ever cast a spell like this, you know this is EDH, and the law of averages never seem to work out. So Animist's Awakening, 
just does not produce enough return on the mana invested, even if we have Zaxara and any of our other plus one, plus one counter or X spell synergies out in the battlefield. Animist's Awakening just does not or has not gotten the job done each time I've cast it in any game that I've been able to do so. So from a personal standpoint, I'm taking that card out for a card that's, gonna, that's going to optimize what we're doing in this deck so much more efficiently. So with Animist's Awakening coming out... Paradox Zone is going to go in. This is an enchantment for four and a green. It ETBs with a growth counter on it. And at the beginning of our end step, we're going to double the number of growth counters on Paradox Zone. Then we're going to create another zero, zero green and blue fractal creature token. And then we'll put X plus one plus one counters on it, where X is the number of growth counters on Paradox Zone. So what we're doing here is we're replacing the randomly, the randomization of getting X number of lands onto the battlefield, which, let's be honest, it's never going to be even close to half the amount of mana we invest in Animist's Awakening. And we're replacing that with a card that's going to, at the beginning of our end step, each time we're going to double the growth counters on something. We're going to create another not we're going to create another token creature, and that creature is going to get more and more plus one plus one counters. And if we have any of our plus one plus one counter doubling spells or effects on the battlefield, like double Doubling Season, Corpse Jack Menace, Branching Evolution. This is going to make Paradox Zone a very dangerous card with which our opponents will need to interact. And fortunately for us, it is an enchantment, which means that the removal for enchantments historically is usually underserved when someone creates an EDH deck. All right, two more cards coming out for two newbies. The next one we're going to bring out is a Thran Dynamo. This is actually a very, very underrated and underutilized artifact. You're investing four mana in it, but each time you turn it sideways, you're getting three colorless mana back. This is one of the best mana ramp. This is one of the best mana ramping artifacts you could play in an EDH deck. However, for the purposes of what we're doing in this. X plus one plus one counter deck, we have a card that can replace three and dynamo and do a much better job of synergizing overall what we want to do. And that card is going to be, it's another artifact, it's Elementalist's Palette. It's a CMC of three, and whenever we cast a spell with X in its mana cost, we put two charge counters on Elementalist's Palette. And this is a spell that is, I'm sorry, this is a deck that is absolutely loaded with X spells. We can tap and add one mana of any color to our mana pool, which for the purposes of mana balance, this isn't pacing exactly with Thran Dynamo. However, we can also tap this for a colorless mana for each charge counter on Elementalist's Palette. We can only spend this mana to cast spells that contain X. So this is absolutely perfect for what we want to do. Once we cast two X spells with Elementalist's Palette on the battlefield, we will already be outpacing the mana produced by Thran Dynamo. Plus, its mana value is 25% less off the bat. Plus, this gives us a color, uh, one mana of any color, which will allow us to fix the mana to cast any of the spells that we need in a three-color deck. As the game goes on, if this is in our opening hand, this is going to be a threat because we're going to be able to turn this sideways. And for every X spell that we've cast when Elementalist's Palette is on our side of the battlefield, it's going to get two charge counters, which equals to two colorless mana, which is just going to make our X spells that much more dangerous. That's why this spell is replacing Thran Dynamo because it synergizes with its theme and the reward is so much higher than the three mana that can be produced by Thran Dynamo. All right, one more change for Zaxara today coming out. We're bringing out a Hydra. We are taking out the Hungering Hydra. This bad boy is an X and a green. Of course, it's going to ETB with X plus one plus one counters. It can only be blocked by one creature. That is all. It cannot be blocked by more than one creature. So this is kind of like the reverse of Menace. And whenever Hungering Hydra is dealt damage, we put that many plus one plus one counters on it. Do you know what's lacking here with this huge, huge creature? Evasion. This technically can just get chump blocked by zero, one, or one, one tokens for days. 
We're not looking to do that. We want as much, as much evasion as we possibly can in any creature spells that we invest mana into. Some of the spells that we showcased during this installment of the Up and Up series don't necessarily deal with evasive creatures, but that's because we can utilize their abilities and their effects to create multiple 0, zero creatures with plus one, plus one counters on them. If we're going to invest the mana into a Hydra, we want that Hydra to get the biggest bang for its mana buck. With that in mind, the Hungering Hydra is coming out and going in its place is going to be the Neverwinter Hydra. Double X and two green for a zero zero. When it ETBs, we roll X D6 die dice. So that means if we pay X three, we pay three three and then two green, we'll roll three D6s. It's going to enter the battlefield with a number of plus one plus one counters on it equal to the total of these result of those results. So think of it like this. We're going to invest, let's say, we'll invest eight mana into Neverwinter Hydra. Three for X, three for the second X, and then two for the green. We're going to roll three D6, and the, the floor of this creature will come into play with three plus one plus one counters. The ceiling will be 18, just for the investment of eight mana. And it has Trample. And additionally, it also has Ward 4, which allows it to protect itself because whenever a creature becomes the target of a spell and ability one of our opponents control, we're going to counter that ability unless that opponent play unless that opponent pays four mana. So Neverwinter Hydra is going to come down, could be much larger than the plus one plus one counters we initially put on Hungering Hydra, has the evasion of trample, and has built-in protection. This Hydra upgrades the number of this hydra upgrades the quality of hydras that we have in this deck by replacing the hungering hydra and that was a lot of word that was a lot of sentences with the word hydra all right there it is 10 cards going in 10 cards coming out of our zaxara the exemplary build let me know your thoughts in the comment section below this is mtg burgeoning your channel for all things magic